Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Tips and Tricks When Using Filter Plates of Spin Devices with Nucleic Acid, Protein Purification, and Cloning Applications. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Paul Life Sciences. To learn more, visit paul.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. We, you may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. In addition to submitting questions, we encourage you to answer poll questions when they are posted. Click on the option that best describes your answer. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Lima Fabule, PhD, Global Product Manager for Molecular Laboratory Product Portfolio at Paul Corporation. Lima, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Marie. Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for joining this webinar uh, today. So as Marie introduced already, my name is Lima, and I'm a global product manager for Molecular Product Portfolio at Paul Corporation. And today's presentation is based on the filter plates and centrifugal spin devices that can be used for a various life sciences research applications. However, today I will be focusing on the nucleic acid um, extraction and purification, protein purification, and cloning applications. So just before I begin my presentation, um, I would like to better understand the audience that we have today or that joined us today. And you should see on your screens a quick poll survey coming up. So if you can just take a moment and answer that survey, that would be great. And I'll just give you a couple moments before we begin the presentation. So I see a couple attendees already participating. Thank you. All right, so I see that uh, most participants actually are based at biotechnology industry following by academia. Um, great. Thank you so much for your participation. So let's just move on. I do have to show this legal disclaimer, uh, which claims that Paul laboratory products and the products that I will be talking about today are designed for professional laboratory applications only. So these products are not approved for use in medical, clinical, surgical, or other patient protection applications. It is, not, it is also not suitable for use in biopharmaceutical manufacturing or production. So during today's presentation, I would like to start uh, by just really a brief introduction uh, on Paul Corporation for those who are not familiar with the company. Then I will go over uh, very briefly sample preparation, filtration, and separation basics. We'll go over filter plate product family overview, following by the centrifugal spin devices product overview. And then we'll talk a little bit about what you should look at when it comes to choosing the right membrane or filter for your specific application. We'll go over some applications as well as performance data and study examples. And at the end of the presentation, we do have a Q&A session. So please feel free to post uh, your questions um, via chat that you see on your left hand side of the screen throughout the presentations, which I will answer at the end. So Paul Corporation or Paul Labs is a global company and our expertise is in filtration, separation and sample preparation solutions. And our products could be grouped into two major groups, which are quality control and life sciences research. And when we talk about the quality control, we are specializing in products for environmental monitoring, 
micro QC or sterility QC, as well as analytical chemistry or analytical QC for, for product validation. Now, when we talk about the life sciences research, we are talking about the products that are designed for molecular uh, applications. And some of the applications include such as nucleic acid extraction and purification, protein purification, cell eye development, cloth optimization and selection, and so many more that I will show you uh, as we go along. So when we talk about sample preparation, purification and filtration, um, of course, this is not the area where you would like to spend a lot of time thinking about it and putting a lot of energy into it. However, I think it's really important to understand the filtration methods uh, because by selecting the right method for your application, um, it may affect your outcome or initially data and even your molecule quality. And when we think about the filtration, uh, we are thinking about two major aspects of the filtration, which are microfiltration and ultrafiltration. And if you look at that image on the right-hand side of your screen, it may help you to better understand the difference between those two filtration methods. So as you can see, microfiltration is really a method to remove larger size particles or particles. Everything that is our uh, or is larger than 0.1 micron in size. And those particles could be colloids, cells, bacteria, viruses. You would use microfiltration filter if you want to remove gross particulates and raw cells, as an example. Now, if we talk about the ultrafiltration, we are talking about small size molecules and particulate removal or even separation. So anything that is smaller than 0.1 micron, uh, we would be using ultrafiltration filters. And again, when we talk about the ultrafiltration, we are thinking about uh, nucleic acids and proteins. So we're talking about the molecules at molecular level. If you look at some of the main applications for microfiltration, um, it would be pre-filtration, sterile filtration, and of course, cell-based assays, whereas uh, some of the main applications that would be used under ultrafiltration, it would be concentration, diafiltration, which is really mainly buffer exchanges, as well as size fractionation. Now, what is really nice uh, about the filtration or one of the biggest benefits of the filtration is that the method is mechanical and it's not requiring any harsh chemicals to be used in order to remove or separate your molecules, uh, which is a big thing, especially if you're working with the nucleic acids or proteins, because you do not want to change your protein structure or function. Um, if you would use some harsh chemicals in that filtration method. So indeed, filtration has a huge advantage to uh, compare to other separation or filtration methods that are available that are require harsh chemicals to be used. Now, if we think about the microfiltration a little bit further, um, as, as I mentioned again earlier, so this method is used for removal of the larger particulates. And um, what you really need to think when, when it comes to membrane selection or filter selection is two critical parameters. So you would need to think about the pore size as well as effective filtration area. Now, the pore size is just really uh, tells you or it would depend in terms of what exactly you're trying to filter whereas the effective filtration area would depend uh, on how much of the sample you would like to filter. And once again, if you look at that table on the right-hand side, um, you could see various sizes of the pores, uh, pores or membrane pore sizes listed. And if we kind of look from the bottom, uh, first step that has depth media and glass fiber, uh, and we move up those steps all the way to 0.1 micron pore size containing media, we see that the usage of those membranes significantly reduces. So for example, 
we'd be using deaf media to remove large particles from the sample uh, just to clean up that sample before we would uh, move, let's say, to the sterile filtration. So again, that death media filter would be used in many more applications compared to the sterile filtration filter. What's really nice is that Paul actually has to offer a dual layer membrane in some of our devices. Uh, and what that really means that a single device has two layer membranes. And what that allows you is that we can perform two filtration steps in a single one step and a single device. So again, as example, um, these membranes could be such as um, containing deaf media over sterile filter. Again, that me deaf media would be used for large particle removal before the sample is further cleaned up uh, using a sterile filtration filter just to really remove that bacteria which is mainly used for. Now let's move on into filter plates product family overview. So over here you can see um, listed parameters and specifications uh, that our filter plates come in and of course we have a huge selection of those filter plates available that do range in throughput, membrane, pore size as well as design. And when we talk about the throughput, we do offer 24, 96, and 384 well filter plates. Of course, all those plates also vary in the volume that sample can be processed and membrane and pore size. Now, most of the filter plates um, are designed for a specific application. Um, and that's why the membrane and pore size would be specific for that particular application. However, we do have some general and universal filters that I will cover later on. And with regards to the design, um, it's a crucial point, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a few moments, uh, especially if you're performing a high throughput analysis using automated or robotic systems. And I would like to run another poll very quickly uh, to see really what type of plates you are using in your research or routinely use in your lab. And if you can take a moment and answer that question, that would be great. So once again, I'll just give a few moments. And again, I see already uh, results popping up and it's not surprising uh, right now, 100% uh, answers are based on the 96 well plate. Um, it's not surprising at all for us as well, because that is the plate that uh, we see our end users using most. So thank you for the participation. With regards to the uh, Plate selection consideration, um, I would like to talk about three things or three aspects that may help you when it comes to what or which filter plate I should select. And these are really straightforward things that I will mention. First of all, is a throughput, uh, really just to know if you're working with uh, a high throughput sort of workflows that you are processing many samples of course 384 plate or 96 well plate would be the one to use and if you're working with less samples 24 well plate would be ideal solution and again you would need to think about your sample volume and here it's not only about the starting sample volume but also recovered volume so just to think about how much of the recovered sample you would need to perform your downstream analysis. Maybe you'll be using the same sample for several applications. So just keep that in mind. And again, downstream analysis, as I already mentioned, just knowing by what exactly you're trying to achieve, is it the concentrate molecules to remove molecules or separate molecules will help to really uh, select the right filter plate for you. If we look at the filter plate designs, and I did mention this is a, one of the most important aspects of the filter plates that Paul has to offer, I would like to begin with the rigid construction. So what that really construction means or the design of the plate is that um, our plates are strong in, and just that rigid constructions prevents the potential flexing and bending and potentially jamming your automated systems and is super important when you're working with the 
uh, robotic systems. As you know, robotic arm has to handle the plates and move around. So just preventing bending and flexing the plates is important. Another thing is our plates come in smooth, well-designed. And what that really means is that um, it's, it's a big thing, especially if you're working with lower sample volumes, for example, with 384 well plates that have up to 100 uh, microliters of total volume. Um, the smooth well design prevents from um, sample getting caught outside of the wells and potentially losing it. And again, the smooth well design is a great option whenever you're working with resin screening as well as bead bait analysis. So it does prevent that efficient sample recovery process. Another thing to consider when it comes to the filter plates, those plates do come in two outlet tip designs. So we do offer short and long outlet tips. Um, and you can see on the right hand side in those blue circles a schematic representation of that short and long tip and the short tip uh, plate would be used in the cases where the uh, plate height is a crucial uh, aspect. However, we have seen that most of our users do use that long tip uh, containing outlet plates because those long tips uh, do minimize the risk of cross-contamination because visually you could see those tips uh, sitting in the receiver plate and that way it is possible to just really eliminate potential crosstalk from samples. Our plates are micro, uh, micro plate standards and as I mentioned are automated friendly and lastly we do uh, offer um, serial barcodes on the plates, which I think also important, especially if you're working with the high throughput applications, you do want to track your samples as well as plates and the membranes that we use in that particular application. Once again, when it comes to the filter plates uh, for the sample preparation and filtration applications, it's really simple and easy operation. And the filter plates that I've been talking about um, the, the product family is called AcroPrep and all those filter plates or most of them can be uh, processed using different methods. Of course, centrifugation, positive pressure systems can be applied for the 24 uh, well filter plates as well as vacuum system. And as you can see on the right hand side, there's a just really three step example just to show you how it is easy to process and filtrate sample using vacuum system. Uh, in this particular case, a vacuum manifold, and you can see a picture in the center of the slide. That is the system that also is offered by Paul Labs. So a whole workload starts by adding your receiver plate inside the vacuum um, manifold, and then the sample plate is placed on the top of it. Then sample is loaded into the plate, vacuum is applied, your sample is passed through the membrane or filter, and then vacuum is released, and then you are able to remove your sample plate as well as receiver plate. Simple and it's a fast process. We'll move on now on the centrifugal spin devices. So over here, you can see an overview of the spin devices that we have to offer. And again, these devices do range in terms of the processing volume, ranging from 50 microliters and all the way to 60 ml for those applications that require larger volume processing. Spin devices also vary in terms of the membrane that these uh, devices come in, but we do address microfiltration as well as, as well as ultrafiltration applications. I would like to talk a little bit more about the centrifugal device's structure, and we will start with the nanoseps, as you can see on the left-hand side. So the nanosep has a filtrate receiver tube, which is really looking very similar to the 1.5 mil Eppendorf tube. And then it does have a sample reservoir, which contains membrane. Of course, that sample reservoir is added into the filter receiver before that device can be used for filtration. If, if we look at the right-hand side for microsep and microsep structure, again, we do have similar uh, parts. We have a filtration receiver tube 
sample reservoir, memory paddle, and a cap. Now, competitors out there also offer similar devices when it comes to the centrifugal devices. However, uh, there is a big difference with the competitor membrane and our membrane incorporated on a paddle. Now, the competitor spin devices do have a V-shaped membrane, uh, whereas in our cases, that membrane is incorporated on a paddle or paddle design membrane, which actually goes up and down in, in sample reservoir. So, for example, if you are spinning uh, proteins and using V-shaped membrane, uh, you potentially or artificially can create protein gradient, uh, which can cause protein crash outs and aggregates. Whereas using that paddle design, the membrane is incorporated on a paddle, we are able to avoid the potential aggregate protein aggregation. And ultimately, the protein recovery will be much higher compared to the V-shaped membranes. This is a summary table uh, summarizing um, the centrif centrifugal spin devices that we have to offer. And as you can see, as I mentioned already, they do range in terms of the sample volume. You could also see the housing and paddle material that used to manufacture these devices, different filter media or filters, as well as uh, molecular weight cutoffs on pore sizes as well representing for each of those devices. But then I would like to talk a little bit more about the membranes of filters in general. And I think this table would summarize the best. So you could see on the left hand side, we do have a selection of different filters available uh, that come in either filter place, spin devices or both. And mainly these membranes are designed for a specific application and as you can see application listed in a table however there are a couple that we would uh, recommend to use for any sort of general filtration and those would be super as well as wwptfe membrane or um, um, and as well as uh, wwptfe membrane um, can be used or we would call it as a universal membrane so if it's a hydrophilic PTFE membrane that is suitable for most applications, and I would highly recommend just to have that membrane available in the lab whenever you're working with uh, any sort of application. Now, of course, um, if you're working with specifically with organic solvents, uh, PTFE membrane would be more suitable if you're working with um, nucleic acid as well as protein extraction and purification we do have a specific membrane called nucleic acid binding membrane and so on for example even if you're working with ion exchange applications we do have a negatively and positive charge membranes which called mustang um, and as i mentioned so we do have membranes that are designed for specific applications as well as general membranes so before i move on into the applications I would like to run another poll survey question, just asking which particular applications you are performing in your lab. And again, I'll just give a couple moments for you to participate before we move on. I can see that protein concentration and purification is the most commonly uh, used application based on our audience results. And cell lysis cl uh, clarification as well as nucleic acid extraction purification. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so again, in terms of the applications, filter plays as well as centrifugal spin devices can be used in so many different applications. I literally ran out of space just typing those applications in the blue box below. And as you can see, there are so many ranging from nucleic acid extraction, purifications, resin screening, 
but I'm not going to mention all of them here. I do have some uh, performance data and study examples that will cover some of them. So, and we're just moving on into the performance data. And the first example that I would like to show to you is based on the um, clarification and sterile filtration performed using 24 uh, well filter plate containing that dual layer membrane. So two membranes incorporated in a single well. Um, and at this particular case, we use the mammalian show cell cultures and we were looking for protein recovery. Now, as you can see in a table, the actual results look really great. So we looked at the intact cells and the starting material, as you can see, uh, was quite condensed and concentrated cell culture. And what we looked at was the turbidity. So turbidity can be used to measure pre and pro filtration, which really tells us how well we are removing uh, cells that we are not interested in. And as you can see at the beginning, we see that turbidity was measured about 19 to 2600. But then after the filtration, which we also performed in centrifugation as well as vacuum, uh, manifold using uh, method, we can see that that turbidity significantly dropped, which really indicates to us that we were able to eliminate unwanted cells. But you may ask, okay, well, we removed the unwanted cells, but does it mean that we also remove protein? Now, the answer is no, because we did measure protein recovery in percentage, and you can see highlighted in blue, where we can see for this particular assay, mammalian show cell cultures, intact cells, and we see more than 95% protein recovery using 24 filter plate containing those two membranes. So we had a clarification membrane, which removed those bigger particles, and then we use the sterile filtration just to clear up and to recover protein at the end. Similar situation uh, or similar study we performed using yeast uh, cultures as well as bacterial cultures. The same exact filter plate. Uh, we looked at the turbidity and protein recovery, and we also uh, tested the centrifugation as well as vacuum methods. And this time we looked at intact cells as well as lice cells. Again, as you can see, the turbidity from really dense cell lines dropped significantly to the uh, really low numbers, just telling us that we successfully removed unwanted big particles or those cells, raw cells. And then if we look at the protein recovery, again, we are able to obtain a high quality and yield protein for, uh, for any really filtration method that it was used for intact as well as size uh, lysis lysis cells. Another performance example that I would like to show you is based on the molecule retention. So in this particular case, once again, we use the 24 uh, well filter plate, but this time containing different membranes. So it's an omega based membrane because what we're trying to perform is have ultra filtration. We're talking at molecular level and we're talking um, in terms of the pore size in molecular weight cutoffs instead of the micro microns. So what we did, we had a sample that had a variety or a range of different molecules mixed together. And you can see those molecules listed in a table on the right hand side and approximately size of those molecules in kilodaltons. We applied or we used a centrifugation vacuum and positive pressure uh, filtration methods in this case, uh, just to compare which method performs better. And we looked at the retention of a particular molecule. Now, I know this is a busy table or graph that you can see on your screens, but the take home message, it would be just really, it's really important to select the right membrane with the right molecular weight cutoff in order to obtain the molecule of interest. And as example, if we look at the vitamin B12, which molecule is about 1.4 in kilodaltons, if we use the membrane with molecular weight cutoff one, we are able to retain that molecule without any issues. And similar situation, if we would use a membrane containing molecular weight 
three. But if we look at the membrane with molecular weight 10, um, the third graft really from your left, we can see that vitamin D is no longer present. We are really losing it. So that just really tells you how important it is to know which particular molecular weight membrane I should use and what I'm aiming to achieve. Over here, we have an example on the chromatography uh, sorbent screening, as well as resin screening and resin condition screening, which can be used one of the methods for nucleic acid and protein purification. Now, what's really nice is by using plates and this particular membrane that we would recommend super membrane does come in 24 well plate, but as well as 96 well plate, if you're looking for a scale up applications. Uh, but what the filter plate allows you is to screen many different resin conditions. And, 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 and that way you are able to optimize chromatography resin as well as purification conditions rapidly. And also, Another thing is that you don't need to use much of the sample, which is great. We do have a really nice uh, technical note, um, which is walking you through step by step in terms of the how to use the chromatography application in the uh, filter plates. So if you are interested, we will be able to provide that technical note or you can even download from the Paul's uh, website. And as I mentioned previously, uh, a very specific ion exchange chromatography based membrane also is available for those specific applications. Let's talk a little bit about the passivation and really what passivation is, is just additional step that you would need to perform in order to potentially increase your protein recovery. And we do hear some feedback from the field where customers mentioning that uh, the protein recovery is not great. So this study example just really um, confirms that performing that additional step, the passivation of pretreatment of the membrane can significantly improve pro uh, protein recovery. So in this particular, case of what we did, um, we used a nanospin centrifugal device with a specific membrane that had the molecular weight cut off on 30K. And we used BSA protein, which is our recovery protein or protein of interest, which was diluted in two concentrations, 0.1 and 1 micrograms per, micro, uh, per mil. And we also prepared three different uh, passivation buffers or solutions. And we did test at 1% BSA, 5% SDS, and 5% twin buffers in this particular experiment. But as you can see below that uh, data graph, there are other um, passivation buffers that you would be able to use in, a, in addition to the ones that we tested. A whole process is really simple and straightforward. And it just starts by adding that passivation buffer prepared into the spin device, um, leave it to incubate at room temperature for a while. Then it is rinsed with water and added your protein of interest or sample that needs to be uh, recovered. And by spinning down that device, we're able to recover protein with a much higher recovery percentage when, com when compared to the untreated samples, as you can see in that table. Briefly, I would like to touch the Lyset clearance uh, filter plates. And I think it's really important just because we are talking about the nucleic acid extractions and purifications, as well as uh, plasmid DNA uh, recovery. So in some cases, the molecules of interest or in order to obtain molecules of interest, we must lysate cells to start with. And then again, what that would entail us is just really cleaning or removing those lysate cells and then recovering the cells of interest or lysate cells. So in this particular case, what we're really performing is the pre-filtration step and then a further cleanup step. Um, 
again, when we talk about the license clearance, we want to look at the efficiency, how well we can separate uh, and remove the unwanted cells. And then we want to look if we do have the molecules of interest still remaining in a sample. Did we remove the molecules of interest such as nucleic acids or plasmid DNA or not? So again, we do have data to support that using our filter plates and spin devices with this particular uh, membrane, we are able to efficiently remove unwanted cells. And as you can see on a top graph, uh, and a whole this process is measured in optical diameter. And then once those unwanted cells are removed, we want to really look for the recovery. And again, in this particular case, what we did, we compared Paul product to some of the competitor products. And you can see from the graph showing that using Paul product, we are able to recover a higher concentration or percentage of molecules of interest. When we talk about the nucleic acid extraction and purification, I did mention we do have a specific membrane called NBA or nucleic acid binding uh, membrane, which are available in filter plates as well as nano sub devices or centrifugal devices. But what we're talking here about is plasmid DNA, genomic DNA and RNA extraction and purification. So once again, we want to see really the efficiency in terms of the extraction of those nucleic acids, but then um, the quality of those molecules. And as you can see, the molecule or the quality of the obtained molecules is high enough to perform further downstream analysis that are listed in the boxes, ranging from really just PCR or qPCR applications all the way to NGS or uh, sequencing as well as northern blotting applications as well as Sanja sequencing. What's really nice is that using nanoceps as an example, um, the consumable um, and combining those consumables with commercially available reagents or kits, or even using your own made in-house made reagents for extraction of purification analysis, you are able to obtain high quality molecules, which is obviously less expensive. And we do have available protocols um, that also could walk you through step-by-step -step guide how to perform um, that workflow also and how to make those reagents if you are looking into making reagents in-house. With regards to the plasmid DNA um, extraction, I just wanted to show you the quality of the plasmid DNA that was able to obtain using the uh, plates and spin devices uh, that also is suitable for use for downstream analysis such as restriction digestion and cloning applications as well as as sequencing or sanja sequencing and you can see at the bottom of that slide there is a snapshot of the sequence data which shows full length reads and really showing no no interference or quality issues with a starting material and very similar situation with the genomic DNA. But in this case, what we did, we uh, used spin devices or filter plates to extract genomic DNA from um, CHO cell lines as well as HEC cell lines. And we compared that quality with uh, commercially available kits, if you would using commercially available kits. And as you can see from the data, um, there is no really difference in terms of the quality of genomic DNA that can be obtained using our um, consumables. In fact, even for the CHO lines, we can even see slightly higher concentration when compared to the commercially available kits. Similar situation with the RNA extraction. Again, we looked at... Um, the quality of RNA obtained using our products compared to the commercially available uh, kits. But this time we also compared RNA extracted using commercially available reagents and in-house developed reagents. And once again, the quality of RNA obtained is great. It's really high quality and there is no really difference between using spin devices or plates um, compared to the commercially available kits. 
And lastly, I would like to talk about the molecular cloning workflow. And as you may know, the cloning really um, contains so many different steps, ranging from isolation of the fragment from agarose gel, restriction digestions, ligation, transfection, transformation, all through that uh, transform cell line of interest. Now, again, to perform all these steps, you may need different kits um, in order to obtain um, or to perform that step. And if you do need to have a different kit for each of the steps, this may become a costly process and, of course, time consuming. Now, this is where it really nice that Paul has to offer a single solution uh, to go through the cloning workflow as an example, using spin devices. And again, we have a really nice application node that walks you through step-by-step -step guide how to perform cloning workflow using spin devices. And just as an example, I would like to show you just a couple of those. Um, in this particular case, what we're using spin device is for purification or isolation and purification of DNA from the gel slice. And again, as you can see, it's just a two-step process, really straightforward and simple to perform in order to obtain that purified DNA from the gel. So it begins really by having that gel slice macerated and added into the spin device that contains a microfiltration filter to start with. And just really adding that uh, that gel containing DNA into the spin device, um, then spinning down and our gel buffer containing DNA will be passed through through the tube, whereas the uh, bigger particles of the gels will be caught on top of the membrane. That can be discarded, but then DNA containing uh, gel buffer is transferred into a second type of spin device which contains ultrafiltration media. And then uh, really by spinning down that solution, we're able to recover purified DNA just using spin devices. Again, um, in terms of the uh, DNA recovery, we were able to measure that using NANOSEF 100K or molecular weight equals to 100 kilodaltons. Uh, and it was greater than 90%. So once again, just a great solution using spin devices in terms of the DNA recovery and isolation from gel buffer for the cloning applications. And lastly, um, again, spin devices can be used for rapid cloning of PCR products. What's really nice in this case is that restriction and ligation steps can be performed in a single device. So what you would just really need to add is your plasmid, your DNA fragment that you would like to clone, restriction enzyme, leave it to incubate, then spin down, perform several washes, add buffer and ligase, uh, spin down again and let that ligase to, to take effect and end product will be the ligase transformed uh, products. And in this particular, for example, uh, transformed bacteria. Using spin devices, you are able to reduce the number of manipulations and again, plastic. So you need to use less plastics to obtain the same results. And again, this particular protocol is uh, suitable for most standard PCR cloning procedures as the uh, quality of the transformative uh, product is good. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and joining us today. And before I move on and answering any questions, I would like to run last poll, uh, just really looking for your feedback in terms of the webinar. Um, and if you could take a moment to answer that survey, it would be appreciated. And one more thing I would like to mention that you do see on your screens on the right hand side, the resources tab, where you are able to uh, download additional resources, additional collateral um, based on the filter plate family in terms of the selection guide, as well as uh, the differences in terms of choosing 
um, different membrane with the molecular weight cutoffs and two nice application uh, notes reporting some actual studies based on using 24 filter, uh, 24 well filter plates. And thank you very much for those who participated in a survey. And with that, I will be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lema, for your informative presentation. We also have Jorgen de Haan, application scientist at Paul Corporation, joining us for the Q&A session. So we'll now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, are there any ups, are there any scale up application notes available from 24 well sterile filtration and clarification filter plates? Yes, that's a good uh, question. Um, so in terms of the application notes, Jorgen, would you mind to chip in here as sure. your expert in terms of the application notes? <laughs> Sure. Um, so as far as like scale up um, with the um, uh, lysate clearance plate, uh, we don't have really application note from that perspective. Um, but we and actually for scale up, um, I think generally what we would look at more is uh, using super cap depth filters like the super cap 50, which um, are available with the whole panoply of different sites, depth filter media. Um, and have the same configuration uh, as used for all our biotech uh, depth filter uh, devices. So those would be more suitable uh, when you are thinking about scale up. All right, thank you. Um, next question, <clears throat> excuse me. What is the best way to process filter plates, centrifuge or vacuum? Good question. Um, so in terms, in uh, which particular method you are using would depend on the application to start with. But I think the good thing or as a reference to think about if you're looking to um, to pass through solution that you want to 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 use for your downstream analysis, use centrifugation because obviously your sample would be passed through the filter and that liquid retained in the tube would be used for downstream analysis but for, in any other applications i would say uh vacuum would be the method of choice all right thank you next question do i have to use the whole plate once Short answer is no. So again, that's really nice thing about the filter plates. If you don't have enough samples to run, you are not really wasting that plate. You are more than happy to you. You can use that filter plate for just a few sample processing. But a good, um, again, process would be is just to cover the remaining uh, wells with some kind of uh, something that you are trying to avoid to potentially contaminate those wells, uh, just to keeping those wells clean for further usage and, and you would be good to go. So you don't need to use a whole plate at once. If I may add, Lima, um, um, using sort of sealing film to um, seal off, I guess, wells that aren't in use would be uh, especially important also when you use the filter plates on a vacuum manifold or positive pressure manifold um, with, with a microfiltration application, just because um, if you don't have liquid in those wells, um, they will suck false air and then perform um, the, affect the performance of the wells that you're trying to use. Yeah. All right, thank you. Next question. I have never seen a 24 well filter plate. How would I fit it into my workflow? Uh, again, it would depend on the application that you're working on, but um, I would like to give you an example. If you're working with cell cultures, so let's say cell cultures may be grown in a 24 well 
uh, plates. So in that case, it would be really easy for you to transfer those samples directly into the 24 filter plate because it's the same well numbers. But even though if you're using, if you're growing those cells in vessels or shakes or flasks, um, you are able to, to move those samples in the plate. And I think Again, using that particular plate for cell culture, the good thing is that our plates come in a higher volume, so up to 7 ml, uh, allowing you to transfer more starting materia. Um, and using plates just eliminates potential errors um, when you compare using individual spin devices, as an example. Um, and that way, you also can save time you can also improve the recovery and, as I mentioned, to reduce that potential contamination risk. All right. Thank you. Next question. Is the 24 well filter plate different from a deep well plate? Um, so when we talk about the deep well plate, um, those particular plates typically have a solid bottom. Uh, whereas the acro prep filter plates and the filter plates that I was talking about today um, can be used with a solid bottom plate, whereas, for example, 24 filter plates do come with a solid receiver plate, whereas 96 and 284 does not. But just because these plates are really standard uh, microplate standard design you would be able to use with um, standard solid bottom plates um, as a receiver plates all right and i'm not sure you're going to do, do you want to add something in terms of the uh deep well plate and our 24 well plates difference i i think you answered that correctly in the sense that um um, that that a deep well plate generally is a solid bottom plate, um, and um, I would say that the as far as dimensions goes, the twenty four well plate sort of has a similar height as a as a a, a, um, a deep well plate. Um, yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Next question: Which plate has better binding capacity in 96 well and 384 well plates for DNA and RNA? Okay, so again, it usually depends on your application and starting materia. And I do know we do we do have some application notes. Uh, that does talk about the performance based on sample type as well as the nucleic acid desired. But I'll, you're going, would you have a better answer to that? I think it really just depends on the sample time in terms of which one would be better um, binding capacity. Yeah, so basically it, it, there would be plates with either um, our nucleic acid binding plate, which sort of has a, um, um, a silica type of material in it, uh, or, or glass fiber material. Um, so for instance, uh, um, if you want to have the same performance in the 384 well plate as you want as in a 96 well format, then for instance, part number 5072 for the 384 well plate and uh, 8151 for the 96 well plate would have the same type of media and you can sort of have similar performance. Um, but all these plates um, would, would do well um, for DNA and RNA applications. All right, great, thank you. Next question, do you have to buy special equipment for the 24 well filter plates? The short answer is no. And again, just because our plates uh, were designed to meet micro plate standards. So you would be able to use the 24 well containing uh, filter plates with your standard equipment. Um, and again, you don't need really to look into something special in terms of these centrifuges. It would be just really a standard uh, yeah. 
again, I think maybe just want to add, sorry, Jorgen, I guess the sure. height um, would need to be considered, as I mentioned, we do have those plates coming with short and longer outlet tips. So as long as the height of that plate is compatible with your centrifuge or even liquid handling systems, you would be okay. All right, great, thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Are processing parameters the same for all plates, i.e., will it take the same time, require the same speed, et cetera? So typically, time to process samples will vary um, depending on membrane type, uh, membrane pore size, as well as the application. Um, in addition to sample characteristics as well. So it just really depends on the sample. So it would, it would not be exactly the same, but we do have recommendations in terms of what is the maximum volume that you should use to start with and what would be the speed if you're using the centrifugation and time that it needs to optimally filtrate that sample. All right. Well, thank you again, Lima and Jorgen, for your time today and your important research. Do you have any final comments for our audience? All right. Well, thank you again, Lima and Jorgen, for your time today. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Paul Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone, and goodbye.